Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson six. We're going to start looking at statistical physics. Um, I know you guys just finished a course in thermodynamics, so I'm not going to go over all this in detail, but we will have some board work today where you'll get to exercise your combinatorics a little bit. But let's, let's talk about three particles in an infinite square well. Let's suppose I have three particles in an infinite square well of size A and one of them is in a state capital A, one of them is in state capital B, and one of them is in state capital C. Uh, and the question is, how are they sharing the energy? Let's say they have a total energy that's fixed. Well, since the energy is proportional to the sum of the squares of the state numbers, then it means that the sum of the squares of the state numbers has to be constant. Now let's just take a random number. Actually, it's not completely random. Because it turns out if, if the sum of the squares of the states is 363, there's uh, several different ways to achieve that. You can have n a, n b, and n c all equal to 11. You could have two of them equal to 13 and one equal to 5, or two equal to 1 and 1 to 19. Or you could have 1 5, 1 7, and 1 17. So on the board today, we're going to be working through the various combinations of these guys to see what happens when we're dealing with distinguishable particles, fermions and bosons. So that'll be on the board today. There is a, uh, a couple of conclusions you can make in general if you have a total number of particles is capital N and you've got N1 in state 1 and N2 in state 2 and N3 in state 3 and so on and the degeneracy of each of the states is D1, D2, and D3 then the total number of ways you can have those particles distributed in that fashion turns out to be this monstrous looking product if the particles are distinguishable. On the other hand, if they're fermions, there are some combinations that can't happen. And as a result, the number of ways you can combine the particles is uh, diminished from what you'd get for distinguishable particles. And finally, if they're bosons, then it turns out the number of ways is also different. And we're actually going to revisit this formula discover how it comes about in detail when we talk about solids here in a little bit. I am going to work through the case of the Einstein model of solids in some detail. So um, what is the occupation number or the expected number of particles in the nth state? It turns out it depends on the energy of the state and the degeneracy of the state. And it turns out it depends on something called beta, which we'll discover is related to the temperature and another number which is basically a normalization constant that's needed to get the total number of particles to work out right. If the particles are distinguishable the formula ends up looking like this. If they're fermions it's a little different and if they're bosons it's a little different. So the idea is the expected or the, the most likely distribution of particles in states depends also on the nature of the particles. And uh, Griffiths does a lovely job of describing where these formulas come from and how they come about. So I'm not going to repeat all that in the slides, but uh, we can talk about it in class if you're interested. All right, so I want to work through an example in detail that shows sort of how this works at an elementary level. And uh, the idea is if you have a solid that's made up of atoms, at some in, in some very elementary way, you can think of each atom as a quantized simple harmonic oscillator. But a three-dimensional symmetrical quantized simple harmonic oscillator is really just three one-dimensional simple harmonic oscillators because the potential is proportional to the sum of the squares of x squared, y squared, and z squared. And so the uh, Schrodinger equation factors into three separate equations and each one looks like a one-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator. And uh, this, by the way, is an approach that's used in an elementary textbook called Matter and Interactions, introductory textbook by Bruce Sherwood and Ruth Jabay, um, and I'm just stealing their idea. I think it's a lovely plan, and uh, it's a nice approach that I'm uh, familiar with, and I think it helps students understand where this stuff comes from. So I want you to imagine we have an atom in a solid that can be approximated as three independent quantum simple harmonic oscillators. And the idea is, let's imagine for a moment that it, at this moment it happens to have four quanta of energy. That is, that it's got if you look at the three different directions, the total energy, including the three different directions, adds up to four h bar omega. Um, how many ways are there to distribute four quanta of energy among the three? 
Well, you could have one in the n equals four state and, or, uh, and two in the n equals zero state. You could have the middle one in the four and the two in the zero, the outside ones in the zero, or you could have the right hand one in the four and the other two in the zero. That's one possible combination. But you could also have um, these guys uh, in different combinations of three, zero, and one, or you could have two, two, and zero, or two, one, and one. So, and if that, that turns out to be all the different ways you can do it, that adds up to 15, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so there are 15 ways, and those are called microstates. So it turns out there's 15 ways to distribute four quanta among three oscillators. But uh, each of those ways, we're gonna call that a microstate. And um, in statistical thermodynamics, the idea is that every possible microstate is equally likely. And in the end, we really don't care about the microstates. All we care about is the stuff we can see and measure, and those are called macrostates. So uh, a macrostate is simply a, not a particular way of distributing the four, but the fact that there are four quanta there distributed in some way. That's kind of the idea. Okay, now suppose we have two atoms. Each of them has three oscillators. But uh, let's say they're connected in some way. So they share a total amount of energy, like, for example, four quanta, but that at any given moment, one of them could have four and the other could have zero, or the first one could have three and the other one could have one, and so on. How can that energy get distributed between the atoms? So for example, let's say how many ways can one have four and the other have none? Well, there's only one way to have none, and there's 15 ways to have four. So that means that there are 15 ways of one having four and the other having none. But what if one had one and the other had three? Well, you can work out just as we did the number of ways of having three. It turns out there are 10 ways. How many ways are there of having one? Well, an atom has three directions, so it could either be one in the x direction, one in the y direction, or one in the z direction. That would be the only way to have, there are three ways to have one. Well, there's 10 ways to have three and three ways to have one, so altogether there's 30 ways that one atom could have one and the other atom could have three. Does that make sense? If you keep doing that, of course they could each have two and so on. If you keep working that out, with two atoms, each with three oscillators, and a total of four quanta, you end up with a, uh, a picture that looks something like this. There's 15 ways of the first atom having zero and the other atom having four, and there's 30 ways of the first atom having one and the second atom having three. It turns out there's uh, 36 ways of both of them having two, and so on. And so you can see that the most likely situation is the one that has the most possibilities. And that turns out to be each of them getting two. Is there a way to come up with a formula that would enable us to reproduce these numbers even if the number of atoms and the number of oscillators was, was larger? And yeah, it's actually Griffith's equation for bosons because these oscillators behave like bosons um, since there's no restriction on the number of quanta you can have in any one uh, oscillator, then uh, these things are basically bosonic in nature. And uh, the formula turns out to look like this. Um, it's the number of quanta plus the number of oscillators minus one factorial divided by the number of quanta divided by the number of oscillators minus one. And we'll talk about in class how, where that actually comes from. There's a nice picture you can use to convince yourself that that's correct. Um, but basically, it's uh, straightforward mathematically, at least, to compute how many combinations there are. So suppose we did the same project, but now we used 300 oscillators in one clump of material and 200 oscillators in a different clump of material and calculated the number of ways of one of, the one of the clumps of material having so many quanta and the other clump of material having so many quanta, we'd get a graph that looks something like this. Um, what you have there is the fraction of um, quanta 
Let's say, it, oh, this is an example with 100 quanta altogether distributed between these 500 oscillators. And the most likely situation is when 60 of the quanta is in the first chunk of material and 40 are in the second chunk of material. So we're looking at the number of quanta of energy in the first chunk as a function, uh, as the horizontal axis, and the number of combinations of uh, ways of doing that as the vertical axis. Notice that the numbers here are dramatically larger. The numbers go up to 7 times 10 to the 114th uh, number of microstates. So it becomes dramatically larger, and this is with only 500 oscillators. Uh, in a real chunk of material, of course, you've got 10 to the 23 oscillators, and so the distribution of microstates becomes very, very sharp. If you take the logarithm of the number of microstates and you graph that, it also has a peak at the same place. Um, notice something about the logarithm of the number of microstates. There's the, the, the omega 1 is the number of ways of putting Q1 oscillators in block 1, and omega 2 is the number of ways of putting Q2 oscillators, or Q2 quanta, excuse me. Let me start that over again. Omega 1 is the number of ways of putting Q1 quanta in block 1. And omega 2 is the number of ways of putting Q2 quanta in block 2. Uh, notice that if there are zero quanta in block 1, there's only one way to do that. But the natural log of 1 is 0. So the natural log of omega goes to 0 when the number of ways of doing putting that many quanta in is 1. But uh, as you go to the right, as you increase the number of quanta in block 1, the number of microstates goes up. But at the same time, the number of microstates for block 2 goes down. It starts at a maximum when you have 100 quanta in block 2, and it goes to 0 when you get uh, only 0 quanta in block 2, because there would be only one way to put zero quanta in block 2, and that would have a natural log of omega 2 of 0. But how many ways are there to put uh, q1 quanta in block 1 and q2 quanta in block 2? It's going to be omega 1 times omega 2, because for every configuration of the q1 quanta in block 1, there are omega 2 configurations of the q2 quanta in block 2. And so overall, it's the product. So we're looking at the natural log of the product of the two, but the interesting thing about natural logs, of course, is that the natural log of the product is the sum of the natural logs. So if you think of the natural log of omega 1 as a number and the natural log of omega 2 as the number, the natural log of the product is just the sum of those two numbers. So you add those two curves together to get the total, or the natural log of the product, and you can see that the equilibrium is the point where those two curves added together has a maximum. Okay, so it turns out we define something called entropy. Entropy is related to the number of microstates that are available in a certain macrostate. So in other words, for a given total energy it's, uh, or distribution of energy, it's the number of ways you can have that configuration. We use the natural log of the number of states because it matches, the natural log of the number of states actually matches the historical notion of this concept of entropy. And uh, so we calculate the entropy as a constant called the Boltzmann constant times the natural log of the number of microstates. The Boltzmann constant you're familiar with, I'm sure it's got units of joules per Kelvin. Um, some folks use entropy in terms of information theory and they usually use the natural log base 2 of the number of microstates, and they call it the information. Information and entropy are exactly the same thing. So what happens if, uh, if our system begins out of equilibrium? Well, let's say we had 90 quanta in the first block and 10 quanta in the second block. Well, it's more likely that it's going to move toward the equilibrium configuration because there's more ways of doing that. And since there's more ways of doing it, that means that uh, if you choose at random a particular configuration, you're vastly more likely to find yourself at equilibrium than in any other place. I also want you to notice that uh, in order to reach equilibrium, the condition 
is that the slopes of those two curves be equal at equilibrium. Because notice that uh, if the slopes are not equal, then that means that it pays to move in the direction um, of the line that has the greater slope. So if, if we're, let's say we were down at Q1 equals 20, the curve for S1 has a greater slope than the curve for S2. That means moving to the right increases the entropy more by increasing S1 than it decreases S2. But if you reach the point where the two slopes are equal, then you don't buy anything by moving to the left or to the right because the increase and the decrease is going to be the same either way. And so that's the point where you're, you're balanced between the two directions. And so the condition for equilibrium is that uh, ds dq is equal for the two objects. But uh, it turns out ds dq is directly related to the energy, or to the temperature, excuse me, ds dq. And in fact, we're going to define temperature to be the reciprocal of the slope of this curve of s versus energy. Now remember q is the number of quanta, but each quanta is h bar omega, so dE is h bar omega dq. So they're directly related to one another. On the other hand, this idea of specific heat capacity is that uh, if you throw some heat into a system, its temperature changes, and the heat capacity is related to the rate at which the um, energy goes up, or the energy required to change the temperature by some fixed amount. So the way you find the heat capacity statistically is you throw in one quantum of energy, you calculate the change in the entropy uh, on either side of that number of quanta, and then you calculate the change in the entropy to get the temperature, and then you use the uh, change in the energy for a small change in temperature to get the heat capacity. And if you do that process, which we pro So anyway, when you work all that out, it turns out you get a fairly simple result. At low temperatures, um, the heat capacity goes to zero. At high temperatures, it reaches a limit. It works out to be about three Boltzmann constants per atom in terms of um, joules per Kelvin per atom. So um, that's kind of a neat universal result. And we're going to check it out in class today. But, uh, and of course, at low temperatures, the heat capacity approaches zero in a way that's predicted pretty well by this very simple model. There are more sophisticated models that do an even better job at low temperature. But the fact that the Einstein model does as well as it does is, is pretty amazing. Now, finally, we're going to do a fun topic. It turns out I, I want to start working on our quantum computing business and how you actually build quantum computers. And so, I want to introduce the idea of an ion trap. An ion trap is basically, this is a particular kind of ion trap called a quadrupole trap, where you have uh, four electrodes. Two of them are positive and two of them are negative. And you notice that at any given moment, the field that's produced is unstable. That is, there's a force that tends to push the ion toward the center along one direction, but it tends to pull the ion away in the other direction. The trick of the ion trap is to have the field oscillate quickly so that the the f two directions change places periodically. And uh, here's an example of a, such a trap that's actually been built. And uh, what I'm going to show in a little bit is a demo. Actually, I'll probably show it in class. We'll do a demo of a Visual Python program that illustrates the actual trajectory that this thing has. And uh, so that just gives you a little uh, teaser to think about how it all works out. and. Uh, and we'll see how it how it uh, looks in Visual Python in class. We'll see you then.